Looks can be deceiving and it may not be apparent on first inspection of this civilian aircraft. In its civilian livery and non-military markings that this was one of Britain's first spy planes. This is the Lockheed Electra 12. The Lockheed Electra was a perfect camera platform. It could be fitted with cameras in the cabin and in the leading edge of the wing and it meant that with its inconspicuous livery in the years before the Second World War this aircraft would have gone relatively unnoticed in the skies of Europe. Reconnaissance was incredibly important in times of warfare and in the 1930s as Germany became more closed off to the rest of the world, reconnaissance from a ground perspective became virtually impossible. Photo reconnaissance is often a form of intelligence that is overlooked or not really understood. It's not just the taking of the images, but it's the interpretation of what has been taken that is so crucial. It's actually said that around about 80% of all Britain's wartime intelligence actually was taken from photo reconnaissance. And that began with the Electra 12. Just a few days before Germany's invasion of Poland, this aircraft was in Berlin. When it departed Berlin, it was the last British civilian aircraft to depart before the outbreak of the war. The Lockheed 12 was the follow-on to the very successful Lockheed 10, 10-seater 10 that is always going to be heavily linked to the story of Amelia Earhart and her co-pilot Fred Noonan. Flying a Lockheed Electra 10, Amelia Earhart and her co-pilot were attempting to circumnavigate the globe when on what was virtually their last leg on the 2nd of July 1937, communication was lost and the mystery of what happened to them that day has not been solved. Despite this high profile loss, between 1936 and 1941, around 130 Electra 12s were produced. Both the Lockheed Electra 10 and the Lockheed 12 remain popular aircraft in civilian hands. Reconnaissance in time of war has always been hugely important. From the earliest introduction of flying machines, be they balloons or heavier than air aircraft, this type of reconnaissance could then be carried out over the horizon. From the start of the First World War, aircraft began to be equipped with cameras, initially handheld uh, and eventually actually attached to the aircraft. This allowed mapping of the trench networks and again, a better use of that type of intelligence. By the mid 30s, most aerial reconnaissance in the RAF was done by just a handful of people. Despite the RAF having designated aircraft capable of taking aerial photographs, in the years before the Second World War, as tensions with Germany grew, flying a military aircraft over their airspace was just not possible. Hence why a civilian aircraft would fill that need. The Lockheed 12 was equipped with six luxurious and comfortable seats and a lavatory in the rear of the aircraft. Capitalising on the innovations at the time, the aircraft was also quite fast and it had a reasonable range as well for flying corporate passengers across the US. There are many myths and legends that have built up around this aircraft, but a name that will always be associated with this particular Lockheed 12 is Sydney Cotton. After the start of the First World War, Sidney Cotton, an Australian businessman, would enlist in the British forces, joining the Royal Naval Air Service as a pilot. As a result of his experiences flying during the First World War, he came to realise that the pilot's equipment of the day was not adequate. This experience led him to design the first bespoke one-piece flying suit. The Sidcot suit would become very popular with pilots, but it has led on to advances in flight suit technology that we see modern day fighter pilots wearing today. After the end of the First World War, Sidney Cotton would remain involved in aviation, getting involved in photo mapping where his first involvement with cameras on aeroplanes began. Sidney Cotton would become involved with Dufay Colour, an early colour film processing technique. Having obtained the rights to sell Dufa Colour outside of France, he was regularly flying business trips into Europe. And it's around this time that he is approached by MI6 and asked to actually start undertaking these flights. His initial flights with the French were not overly successful. The aircraft themselves were loath to fly beyond the frontier and the camera equipment and the camera operator often didn't take photographs of the key military installations. This led Sidney Cotton to essentially state that for this job to be done properly, he needed his own aircraft and his own crew. This would be provided through illicit means by MI6, leading to the purchase of this aircraft. 
When he was given his aircraft, Golf Alpha Foxtrot Tango Lima, he made a number of modifications to it. One was to have a panel removed from the cabin door so photographs could be taken whilst in flight. Two panels were also created underneath the aircraft for downward looking F24 cameras. And there was provision also for two Leica cameras fitted within the leading edge inboard of the engines. So we've come over to the stores here at Duxford to take a look at an item in the museum's collection, in this case, an Air Ministry aerial camera. I think it was an F24, a very automatic camera, a vertical camera. And it was to, as I was a photographic reconnaissance operator later, pilot later, it would have given a very small scale picture, but enough for what our boys wanted it for. This type of camera would have been fitted uh, in the underneath of the Lockheed Electra facing down. When fitted on aircraft, they would have been set so that they overlapped. That would mean that two images taken next to each other could be looked at together through a stereoscopic viewer. And the stereoscopic viewer would allow interpretation of the image by looking at things like heights, shadows, by almost giving a 3D effect through that viewer. The RAF at this time were struggling keeping their cameras working when flying at altitude or in cold temperatures. And he came up with an innovation whereby hot air ducted from the engines was blown over the cameras to remove condensation and to remove the risk of freezing up. The size of the Electra 12's cabin also allowed for the provision of additional fuel tanks. And rumors say that he possibly fitted as many as two extra tanks behind the pilot and co-pilot. And there's certainly evidence that one of those was fitted to increase the range and therefore the endurance of the photographic sorties. Despite being in the employ of MI6, he was able to fly his civilian registered Electra 12 with relative immunity over the skies of Europe. When flying over Germany, his flight plans were dictated by the German government, but he often managed to negotiate and arrange for his flights to go off track to areas that he wanted to photograph. On a number of occasions, he flew high-ranking German dignitaries and members of the military forces on board the aircraft. And there are rumors that whilst they were on board, he also was able to take photographs of the installations they were flying over. Using his cover, promoting his film business, he was often able to fly his aeroplane to locations that would be out of the reach of many other individuals and organisations. The RAF's two main reconnaissance aircraft at the time would have been the Westland Lysander and the Bristol Blenheim. The Lysander was a very stable but slow aircraft. The Bristol Blenheim, on the other hand, while a little bit quicker, was required to fly relatively low to undertake its aerial reconnaissance missions, and this was something Sydney Cotton wanted to move away from. Through experimentation with different types of cameras, different types of lenses, he was able to maintain that level of detail in the photographs from a much higher level. Coupled with his innovation of blowing air over the cameras themselves to stop them from condensing at the higher altitudes, it allowed him to take photographs of a much wider area in every single frame. Unfortunately, once the Second World War would begin, the use of a civilian aircraft over hostile territory would begin to become impossible. As such, he realized a fast, modern aircraft would be required to fly high and avoid enemy attention. Cotton played a part in that he brought to the notice of the part to be yes. the urgent need for a high-speed aircraft yes. or photographic reconnaissance and his idea moved towards using the Spitfire. He was able to acquire two to be modified with additional fuel tanks and removal of armament. Sydney Cotton's concept was proven when in the first four months of the war, the RAF photographed two and a half thousand square miles and in doing so lost around 40 aircraft. In the same period, Sydney Cotton's fleet of two Spitfires covered twice that distance, 5,000 square miles, and didn't suffer a single loss. The story of Sydney Cotton and the Electra are often full of myths. There is often a mention of three of these cameras facing downwards in the fuselage floor of the Electra. During the restoration at Sywell, the restorers have found only two blanking plates in the underside and no evidence of room to have fitted a third. 
The cameras themselves are relatively bulky, so even when mounted facing downwards, they would have protruded above the floor, which also possibly uh, goes against the idea that these cameras were used whilst people were on board, not knowing that the photographs were being taken. With the story of the Electra, Sydney Cotton often makes reference to cameras mounted in the leading edge of the wing. During the restoration of the aircraft, evidence was found where cameras could potentially have been mounted. Sydney Cotton, in various accounts, refers to occasions where, with dignitaries on board, he overflew installations and pressed a button on the instrument panel, which opened up a window and allowed these cameras to be used whilst flying over these installations. The issue with this is that there doesn't appear to have been any evidence of technology to allow those window ports to open even if the cameras had been fitted. So it was unlikely that the cameras in the leading edge could have been used in such a clandestine way. On occasions he had rubbed up against authority possibly the wrong way. We saw in the end of the First World War where he resigns his commission due to disagreements with senior officers and something similar happens to him at the start of the Second World War as well, when having proved the concept of photo reconnaissance and the need for faster, more capable aircraft, his services are no longer required when the fledgling photographic unit is absorbed into the mainstream RAF. While it may be the case that some elements of this story have been exaggerated and embellished, Sidney Cotton and the use of the Electra, his contributions to the development of aerial reconnaissance are undeniable.